So uh, I would now uh, like to introduce the speakers at our uh, final plenary here, um, which is uh, clinical trials and how to find them. What is the focus at UNC? And uh, we have Elizabeth Claire Dees. Uh, Dr. Elizabeth Claire Dees has been a medical oncologist treating breast cancer patients and conducting clinical trials of new treatments for metastatic breast cancer for more than 15 years. In addition to her MD degree, she has a master's degree in clinical investigation from Johns Hopkins with a focus in novel trial design. She leads the phase one trial group at UNC uh, Lineberger Cancer Center, LCC, all these fancy abbreviations. She is also the co-leader of the clinical research program at the Cancer Center and oversees the core resource that supports clinical trial operations. She has been the principal investigator for more than 50 clinical trials. She and her group have a track record of conducting early translational clinical trials, including first in human trials of new anti-cancer therapies. And our other speaker, sorry. Sorry is Jean No. Uh, Jean No has been at UNC Lineberger Comprehensive Cancer Center since 2009 when she created the protocol development group to support the development of oncology investigator initial trials. In this role, Jean consults on study design in close collaboration with the principal investigator and study statistician and is responsible for drafting, editing, and reviewing clinical cancer research studies. She also guides and trains new faculty and fellows on IIT development and IIT process at LCC from study concept through IRB submission. Prior to coming to UNC, Jean worked at, a, at the biotechnology company Amgen for 12 years, where her work was focused on oncology drugs in development. Please join me in welcoming our speakers. Good morning. Good morning. It's nice to see you again. I'm sorry you had to hear that thing twice. Um, so Jean and I are going to tag team which might be a little challenging with the lavalier. So let us know if you can't hear. Um, so you just heard who I am and who Jean Noe is, uh, and, and we are two of the people who write and run and analyze clinical trials for new anti-cancer drugs at, at Lineberger. And we're gonna talk a little bit today about what are clinical trials and are they good for you or not? Um, how should you look for them and, and, and some of the information that might not be answered when you're thinking about a clinical trial or reading a consent form. Um, I will tell you that we tried to really sort of tighten up our presentation so there's lots of time for questions. So what the slides we're gonna show you today are quite different than the handout that we had to submit two weeks ago or whenever it was. So if you want, a copy, a PDF of the actual slides. Um, we've got our email and, and we're happy to, to share that if that would be helpful. Um, okay, so. To start us off, I don't think I need to make this pitch to this audience, but we need new therapy for this disease. Uh, you probably know that over 230,000 women are diagnosed in this country every year, uh, plus more in Canada. Um, uh, with, with breast cancer, and over 40,000 women die each year in this country from this disease, um, which is metastatic breast cancer. So there have been a lot of recent advances in therapies for metastatic breast cancer. You've heard a lot about them yesterday and this morning, but still too many people die of this disease. Uh, here's another way to look at this. It's the awful top 10 list, if you will. So. Breast cancer is the leading cause of cancer in women in this country every year, and the second leading cancer killer, second to lung, um, which of course also needs advocacy and, and work. And here, here's how it ranks uh, among all the other cancers that, that you hear about. I think this is pretty staggering. Um, so, as you know, there have been a lot of new therapies developed uh, to treat metastatic breast cancer, and in fact, we've made incremental gains in outcomes, time to progression of disease, and even overall survival. But those have really been incremental progress and not what we need. So, so the reality is that we need more therapies, and we need therapies that are tested in 
um, really robust, statistically sound clinical trials so that we know before something goes on the market and is widely used whether it actually is effective and how toxic it really is. So we're going to talk today about clinical trials. Okay, so what is a clinical trial? And probably many of you have already enrolled in clinical trials, so I, I, I'm bringing Coles to Newcastle. Um, a clinical trial is, is a research study that involves human subjects. So it's important to remember that most of the breast cancer therapies that we use today are the result of cancer clinical trials, showing that they were helpful. Um, and, and also, I think, important to know that, that clinical trials are available for all types of medical conditions and for all types of cancer and for all stages of breast cancer. So there are clinical trials. If you're, if you're searching for clinical trials, remember that some of those trials listed on a website are going to be for early stage disease or DCIS or prostate cancer, or what, you know, that, that there are trials for, for all, all stages of disease and all types of cancer. Um, another important thing to note, if I don't come back to it, uh, is that in the first stage of clinical trials, uh, phase one trials, in oncology, the very first time a new cancer drug is given to a human being, it's not a normal healthy volunteer. It's a cancer patient. And that's different than dermatology and hypertension and other kinds of research. And it speaks, I think, to the bravery of, of everybody in this room and, and all of your peers. Um, I like this little graphic because it sort of reminds us that before a medication goes into people and might help some people, it starts in a lab, in a petri dish, and then is tested in animal models, and then into human clinical trials. And here's a, a nice graphic, I think, sort of showing you the whole, the whole timeline of how we develop new drugs and, and maybe sort of explaining how incredibly lengthy and costly um, in dollars and people this, this process is. And there are ongoing efforts at the NCI and elsewhere to try to tighten this up, to try to speed development. Um, obviously, this is linked to the funding that Hi Mus was talking about yesterday. But you can see that, and I think I can, I think I've got a pointer, yeah? Maybe not. Um, leaving me without a mouse and without a pointer. Um, so you can see on the left side of the slide that we, things start in the laboratory, like I talked about yesterday, lots of laboratory investigation with cell lines and so forth, and animal models, and then into phase one, then into phase two, then into phase three before something comes on the market. And we'll talk a little bit more about what those phases of disease, uh, of trials mean. But I think it's important to know that, look at the years on the bottom of the slide. So it takes somewhere between 9 and 12 years for a drug to go from a laboratory to being FDA approved and available for widespread use. It takes about 350 to $500 million for that drug uh, to go that far. And it's also important to realize that of all the drugs that make it to a phase one trial, the first clinical trial, only about 5%, excuse me, 5 of them actually make it to FDA approval. And that is sometimes because they're too toxic, sometimes because they don't work, sometimes because a company goes belly up. But there are a lot, there's a lot of new drug development going on that, that we really never see the benefit from, um, which is another sort of striking fact. Um, OK. So now Jean's going to talk a little bit. We thought it'd be important to review what, sort of what are the legal and ethical guidelines that, that that rule the, the, the clinical trials world and, and that are important for you to know about. I don't know. I think they're probably taping. Okay. Hello. <laughs> it's humbling to be here. I came for part of the day yesterday and then this morning, and it, it's just thank you for inviting us. It's very inspiring. Um, like Claire mentioned, we thought it's good for folks to know that are considering clinical trials or who perhaps have been in clinical trials that there are regulations that govern the conduct of these trials and the um, conduct of investigators. And the two main groups responsible for that are the FDA that everyone's familiar with, and their guidelines are in the Code of Federal Regulations, so they're laws. 
And the part about clinical trials is under something called good clinical practice. And the other group is the International Conference of Harmonization, which I'll just refer to as ICH. It's international standards for the conduct of clinical trials. And the two main principles that these groups um, are concerned with are the, the welfare and safety and the rights of patients that go on to clinical trials and the assurance that the data that comes from these trials is, has integrity, is reproducible, and that we can interpret it the way that we are supposed to. So that's their, sort of their two main um, missions with these guidelines. Uh, in the U.S., the ICH is not um, required. It's voluntary. However, most companies require investigators follow ICH, which is just slightly more rigorous than the FDA guidelines. So at UNC and most academic centers in the United States, we will follow the ICH guidelines during the conduct of our clinical trial. So hopefully that will be reassuring to folks. Um, there. Uh, the other thing that we thought it would be um, helpful for folks to be aware of is who owns these trials that you might be considering enrolling on, and what are the different parties responsible for the conduct of the trial. So over the next series of slides, I'm going to talk about the sponsor of the trial, the review committees that need to review the protocol before it gets anywhere near patients, and then Dr. Dees is going to talk a little bit more about the role of the investigator and of the study staff during the conduct of the trial. So if we start with the sponsor, the sponsor is the individual or organization that comes up with the study idea, that writes the protocol, that's the document that describes all the steps and procedures that patients are going to go through, investigators have to follow, um, and the document that talks about or embodies the regulations that I spoke about on the last slide. So um, that the sponsor writes that document and is responsible for the conduct of the trial. And it can be a person, an institution, or a company. So in oncology, um, the three main types of sponsors or who owns the trial are the pharmaceutical industry. Um, so we have a lot of trials and we do some of these at UNC as well where the study is written by um, the company and then they choose the investigators. And sometimes the investigators, in fact, often the investigators have consulted on the design of that protocol, but it's ultimately the responsibility of the company. And one thing we should probably mention is despite the low percentage of drugs that get from uh, the laboratory through phase one and then into phase two, this is an incredibly exciting time for oncology drug development. Um, I mean, I remember when I first started working in this field, holy cow, it's just exploded, the, the number of drugs and other types of molecules that are in trials. So the other um, main sponsor group is the federal government. So the National Cancer Institute runs and is responsible as the sponsor for clinical trials. Of course, they don't just run them at the NCI, but primarily through academic centers in the country through various uh, cooperative groups. And then the third group, and the one that I primarily work on, is investigator-initiated. So if you go to a particular institution and you're invited to participate in a clinical trial, that trial may have been written by your doctor or one of the other doctors at the institution. And then they or that institution is the sponsor of the, of the study. So going back to this list, we've just talked about the sponsor. Then after they've written the protocol and they've selected their investigators, then investigators who decide to participate in the trial have to route that protocol through a review committee at their institution. So for UNC, because we're a comprehensive cancer center, one of the mandates we have to follow is we have to have this protocol review committee. And it's primarily made up of scientists, other oncologists, hematologists um, that, that aren't the investigator for the trial, but their peers. And they look at the study along with other disciplines, so radiation oncology, um, biostatistics. Each of our protocols has to be reviewed and approved by this group to ensure the safety is uh, the science of behind the protocol is appropriate. So the statistician makes sure that the data are going to be meaningful and that the analysis plan is appropriate for that particular study. So that process happens first. And um, as I mentioned, it's primarily interested in the scientific quality. And then it goes to the Institutional Review Board. And I'm sure many of you have heard about the IRBs. And their, their the mandate really is patient safety. So has the investigator, has the sponsor taken into account 
all the things that the patient would need to know in order to participate in this trial. Is the informed consent really an informed consent? Is the trial designed appropriately? Again, their primary focus isn't science, but if the science has a direct impact on the safety, then it is going to be under their provenance. So, um, that's their primary goal. And they're, again, part of the regulations that I mentioned. You have to have an IRB review your study. And then lastly, um, the FDA may or may not be involved in the review of every protocol that an institution may offer a particular patient. It depends. Uh, Dr. Dees showed you that timeline of drug development and all the way up until the point of commercialization or being on the market, the drug is considered investigational. Any study of an investigational drug, whether that study is written by a company, by the federal government, or by an individual investigator, has to be reviewed by the FDA. Once the drug's on the market, it may or may not need to be reviewed by the FDA. It depends on what we're doing with that commercial drug. Are we using it in a different manner than the FDA previously approved or not? And one thing I wanted to mention, even though it's not directly tied in here, but again, looking back at that timeline of 9 to 12 years for drug development. That's across all therapeutic areas. And um, a number of years ago, the FDA made a concerted effort to shorten that timeline for very serious diseases like cancer. And there are now four different review mechanisms that have been implemented by the FDA to try to shorten that time frame. The latest is one called breakthrough designation. And that's for particularly promising drugs that perhaps in those animal models and early phase clinical trials look like they're really going to have an impact. So just to make a point that folks recognize it is taking too long and are really making a concerted effort. And if you have any questions on that, we can answer that at the end. And now I believe Claire, back to Claire, to talk about the um, investigator and other study team members. Jean has a treadmill. Jean has a treadmill at her desk. So it was her idea that we would run back and forth and um, <laughs> get this talk in tandem. Um, okay, so, so what's the role of the investigator? What, you know, what do I do? Um, the principal investigator and her co-investigators are responsible for the conduct of the study. So once this protocol document is approved, uh, the, the investigator and her team are responsible for recruiting and enrolling patients and then taking care of them on this clinical trial paradigm, following the steps that are laid out, doing it all the same for every patient, um, and gathering the data, collecting the data in a, in a secure and accurate fashion, uh, and then following the regulations and analyzing the, the docu uh, analyzing the data. But obviously, one person can't do all of that alone. So as you know, if you've been on a clinical trial, there are lots of members of the team. So there are probably one or more clinical study coordinators. Sometimes they're nurse coordinators. Sometimes they're clinical research associates, um, various levels of, of training and different types of training. There's a whole staff of data managers who help collect and enter the data into usually an electronic case report form record. They're regulatory personnel. So we have a whole staff of folks whose job it is is to be sure that the documents go from point A to point B, get through the IRB, make whatever amendments are needed, that the consent form is, is drafted and reviewed appropriately, that we renew our application to the IRB and the FDA every year like we're supposed to. If anything happens that's an unexpected side effect, that those documents are re reported to the authorities that need to see those. The pharmacist is very important. Um, you didn't hear about Jean's life before she entered uh, cancer clinical trials research, but, but she's a pharmacist. We have a whole staff of investigational drug pharmacists who help us dispense the medication appropriately and give instructions to patients. And then lab technicians. So a lot of these cancer trials require, as we talked about yesterday, biopsies and extra blood tests and so forth, and somebody needs to process um, all of that blood and, and, and do what we're supposed to to get the biomarkers assayed. Um, so this is a picture again that Gene put in. It's me and two of our coordinators and one of our lab techs, and he's got his uh, centrifuge there behind him. Um, all right, so talk a little bit about um, the phases of clinical trials um, and, and really sort of define these for you. There are four phases of, of clinical trials and drug development. 
one, two, three, and four. Um, and, and the phase one trials, um, which is what I primarily do, are the, the trials that are the first time that we're using a new drug in cancer patients. And the goals of these studies really are to define what's the side effect profile, what's the safe dose, what's the maximum tolerated dose, or what's the best biologically effective dose. Typically, these trials are pretty burdensome on people. Um, they might require many visits, many blood draws, mostly because we don't know very much about these drugs and we want to be very, very um, sure that we're following people very closely, that we're recording any sort of side effect, and that we know how rapidly is someone's body clearing this medicine out of their system. So that's what we call pharmacokinetics, lots of blood draws. So phase two is after you've determined what's the right dose to give people. Um, and, and I should add that in phase one testing, many times it'll be a phase one trial in all people with breast cancer, but it might be a phase one trial in people with advanced cancer of all types. So phase two is taking that, that dose that we think is the safe and right dose into a group of people, a small group of people who all have the same kind of cancer and probably who all have had the same number of prior therapies or the same type of prior therapies um, and, and there are probably other criteria to, to make it more of a, a, a uniform group and then to test how, how does this drug work? How, what's the response rate? How long do people live after taking this drug? So it's the first efficacy study. And then phase three is where a new drug, if it's really promising, is compared to standard of care. So those are big randomized trials, usually not just in one cancer center, but in a, a collaborative of cancer centers across the country or across the world. Um, and, and those are usually funded by the NCI or by big pharma, not, not by a single institution, um, and typically enroll somewhere between you know, 300 to 3,000 patients per trial. Phase four, we'll just throw in here, you don't hear much about it, but phase four testing is after a drug has gone on the market. And usually these are industry-sponsored trials where they're seeking to collect information on long-term safety, for example. So, so are there any surprising findings that come out after a drug is, is, is widely used um, in the community? All right, so Jean. Um, so, one of the things we thought would be important to hear about, you heard a little of this yesterday from Dr. Muss, but the importance of biomarkers, a marker of a biological process. And if you look at this as a slide of um, a breast cancer tissue on the bottom of the slide, and you're familiar with biomarkers, even though you might not know that's what they were called, but if you're a HER2 overexpressing, that HER2 is a marker of your tumor, or if you have estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor positive disease, that's a biomarker. And think about the implications we now know. Uh, if we know if you're HER2 or ER or PR positive, we know different treatments that may or may not be effective in you. And we need to know more biomarkers. We need to, to be able to expand that list. And so we're able to treat folks even more individually than we are now. And so more increasingly, because that's recognized, more and more studies include studies of biomarkers. So there's many definitions, um, but the simplest one is just, again, a marker of some biological process. So um, how do we get at these biomarkers? Usually that's when we ask for additional blood draws or increasingly biopsies of the tumor. And you know, Dr. Muss mentioned yesterday and Dr. Dees this morning, you know, it can be really important to get that tissue at various points along the course of your care. So when you're originally diagnosed, perhaps when you recur and when you have metastatic disease, because the disease changes and we can learn things. And this is one of the avenues of research for finding out why do metastases happen in the first place. Um, so we can also learn in the conduct of, an, of a particular study, why is this tumor seem to be responding and this one doesn't? Yesterday, someone asked the very sophisticated question about being on a trial of a PI3K inhibitor, but they didn't have a mutation in that particular uh, gene, and yet they seem to be responding. Exactly, that's what we're trying to figure out. We can't make assumptions that if X, then Y is going to happen. We really have to find out if that's the case, and that's why these studies are so important. And we can learn how the body processes uh, the drugs. So 
uh, we ask a lot of patients in clinical trials, and this is another thing that we ask, and it it's, can be quite a burden, and we do appreciate that. So one thing um, we thought would be helpful to put into context is the various types of clinical trial options, not just by phase, but you also have the option of going on a trial perhaps of just drugs that are already on the market or a combination of drugs on the market plus an investigational drug or just an investigational drug. And that can be confusing. When is one option best for you? So one thing, um, when we use the term phase one trial, folks think, oh, this is the first time this drug's ever been put in humans, and am I going to, you know, it's just for safety, and I'm really volunteering for future patients, and that's all true. But it also may be combined with a drug you already would have been treated with. And so it's sort of getting what your standard option is, plus helping us learn about an investigational drug, and we still call those phase one trials. So that's just an idea of getting the kinds of options that are available. And I think, back to you, Dr. Dees is now going to talk about how you can help determine if you're a candidate for a clinical trial. Okay, so we have a, a, series, of, a series of slides on this. So I think one of the questions is, am, should I look for clinical trials? A am I a candidate? W would I be interested in this? And I think we've listed here some of the things to think about. Obviously, first thing to do is talk to your regular oncologist or to several oncologists in second opinions and talk about exactly that question. Is, is, should I be looking for trials and is there a trial that, that, that would work for me? I, I think that what kind of trial you think about entering in terms of the phase of trial and the design of trial might, might um, d depend on where is your cancer? What symptoms are you having from it? What prior therapies have you had? What's worked? What's not worked? Um, what's the phenotype of the cancer? You know, is it HER2 positive? Is it triple negative? I think also, though, it's important to think about how is your health otherwise? You know, if you are um, having to be in your chair or your bed for more than half the day, maybe being treated with an untested medication is not a great idea. Um, if you have um, life and work commitments that mean that you really need to be treated as close to home as possible and there's a good standard therapy that you've not yet had, maybe a trial is not the right idea. And, and then I think also it's important to acknowledge that you might have sort of philosophical or emotional reasons that you would or would not want to go on a trial. Trials require um, that we follow a protocol. So that means giving up control um, uh, uh, to, to adhere to this protocol. So you might not be comfortable with the structure that that demands. You might not be comfortable with the uncertainty. And, and I think you know, this is something for each person and her family and her doctor to sort of think about and wrestle with b before you decide whether you want to go on a clinical trial. So what about a particular trial? Um, you know, what if you're searching on clinicaltrials.gov? I just was searching on that website with a, a new friend outside, and you know, what, how can you figure out if a specific trial is right for you? So you, you might want to think about where you are in your treatment course. A, a phase one trial that's really just first in human might be more appropriate for somebody who's already had three or four standard lines of therapy rather than at the initial diagnosis. Um, you, the, whether you're eligible for a specific trial might depend on which prior therapies. This one particular one we were looking at said, you must have had an anthracycline in the adjuvant setting. All right, so that's AC or TAC. So, so these, these eligibility factors uh, weigh into your decision. A particular trial might only be for ER positive disease. You might not have that. So, so these are the things to look at when you're, when you're screening for trials. Um, another thing that's, that's really, uh, we've seen more and more over the last four or five years, I would say, is that some trials require that you have a particular biomarker. Somebody asked me a question about that yesterday. So that your tumor actually has to be sent off and screened for a particular novel protein before we know if you're eligible for this antibody to that protein uh, in trial. Um, then I think you need to think about what are the expected side effects of this trial? What are the risks? Do I want to put myself through that? So if you have pre-existing neuropathy from your taxol 
and the biggest side effect known of this brand new drug is bad neuropathy. This may not be a great trial for, I mean, so each of us needs to look at these trials with, you know, with your oncologist collaboratively to figure out maybe this sounds really exciting, but it's not right for me. And then I think you need to think about what is the burden? You know, some of the trials that I run require people to be at UNC in the infusion room for nine days over the first three weeks of therapy. That may not be what you want to get into, or it may be. And then I think a careful look at what are the costs involved, both you know, emotional and physical and also monetary. Um, is this still me? See, the tag team. So, so I think the thing to do is talk to your doctor, talk to your family and friends. I think a, a second opinion is always appropriate. Um, if, if you're struggling with metastatic breast cancer, I tell my patients that. And then, and then there are lots of ways to search for ongoing clinical trials. So um, I mentioned the regulations, and in there they focus on the informed consent and what type of information needs to be in the informed consent. Informed meaning you're actually consenting to something that you really understand what you're consenting to. But before we talk about that, taking a step back, even before you want to look at that informed consent document, these are some broad questions that you might want to ask the doctor in considering a clinical trial that they've offered you. What's the purpose of the trial? Okay, it's phase two, but what, what are you looking for? Are you looking to see if it reduces the tumor burden? Are you trying to see if it increases survival? What's the purpose? Um, how will you know if it's working? Um, will you know on me if it's working, if I get scans every particular period of time, or will you not know until the end if, if the study is working? And is there someone I can talk to who's been on the trial? I have a friend with myeloma who is in a clinical trial at NIH, and now she volunteers her time talking to patients that might be considering that to give them an idea of what her experience has been. And just um, this, this uh, website, cancer.gov, clinical trials, learning about. That's actually a nice little um, website to learn uh, more about clinical trials and kinds of questions you can ask. But when you get to the point where you're like, okay, I'm interested in this trial. I, th I, think, I think I'm ready for it. That's when you look at the informed consent document. And, and a couple of years ago, the NCI put together an initiative where they got experts on bioethics and clinical trialists to talk about these documents. And what they're recommending is that they only be about six to nine pages in length. Right now, they're 20 to 30 pages. Not very informative when you have to read that much information. So there's really an effort on trying to make these more informative. And these, these issues, these subjects that are covered, these are required by the guidelines. So if I don't participate, if you don't treat me with this, what are my other options? That should actually be in the informed consent document. Who do I contact if I have questions? Will I get to see the results? And that's not always the case. Again, what schedule of tests and visits will I have to follow? And what are the possible side effects and benefits? And that's one of the areas where I think the consents have become uninformative because people feel like they have to list every possible side effect. And then you're sitting there thinking, well, I. I have no idea what's going to happen. So they're trying to get much more informative in that regard. Uh, privacy issues, of course, that's the big um, area today of focus because of all the genetic information that we can get from patients. And how is that going to be protected? We really have to focus on that in our informed consents and reassure patients of the process and procedures we have in place to protect your, your privacy. Um, Will I have to pay anything additional? And that can depend on who the sponsor of the trial is. Typically, if it's a pharmaceutical-sponsored trial, all costs are covered. But if it's an investigator-initiated trial, any research procedure is definitely going to be um, covered. But what about parking? Um, Dr. Dees mentioned having to come in for a number of days in a row. You may have to pay for parking, things like that that you might not be aware of and you need to be informed about if you're going to consider a clinical trial. And how long am I going to have to stay on this trial? Are they going to be calling me every three months and for how long? Those are the things that are covered. So um, we, we thought at the end we'd just wrap up with what the pros and cons of clinical trials are and then the list of some studies that we have ongoing at UNC. So the pros are the only way you're going to get access to an investigational drug is through a clinical trial for the most part. There are some emergency options, but 99% of the time that would be the only way to get exposed to a, a novel agent. Uh, the 
you know, the extra care that we have to take in following the protocol, while it can be burdensome logistically, does mean you get closer care in general than, than is available to you via standard methods. Most costs of the, re of all costs of the research are covered and some additional costs may be. And of course, we're going to learn something from this trial. And, and that's, everybody here is, is, um, recognizes the value of that. And hopefully the trial will benefit not just future patients, but you as well. But in some of those early first in human trials, you're primarily doing that to help your future fellow um, breast cancer survivors. The cons, uh, and Dr. Dees has mentioned some of these, you might be required to do more visits than you're really prepared for. Some extra procedures, we tend to make biopsies for research purposes only optional, but some trials do require them, and so if you're gonna participate in one, you may have to undergo that if you agree to be in the trial, and then some costs that might not be covered. So resources, where can you find some more information? Um, of course, asking your oncologist, but I talked to one individual out front who said that their oncologist hadn't really, didn't really know much about clinical trials, and this is where your advocacy groups can really help and where your own research can really help. Uh, clinicaltrials.gov is a great website. We are now required to register all studies that we hope to publish in the future, and if you don't, if you don't register your trial, you will not be able to publish in certain reputable journals. So that's the stick they use to get everybody to register their trial. So you should be able to find most ongoing protocols except for some phase ones, because some phase ones do not have to register. And I imagine that was for proprietary reasons within the industry. But all other protocols need to register on clinicaltrials.gov. It's a pretty easy search. Um, website, but there's also another website that pulls from this same database, cancer.gov clinical trials, that you may find even easier to search from. Um, every academic center, uh, comprehensive cancer centers, have their own trials, and they list them on their website, and I think um, Claire's going to go over some of the ones that we have at UNC and then show you our website at the end. Okay, last couple of slides, and then got some great, great questions to talk about here. Um, so at UNC today, we have 18 trials open that would be available for women with or men with metastatic breast cancer. Um, and I've just sort of listed the types of trials they are to give you a flavor of what we're doing here. And there'll be a similar list at whatever comprehensive cancer center is near where you live. Um, so there are, are three phase one trials that are specifically for women with metastatic breast cancer. Some of them are, um, are trials that are just the investigational drug, and as Jean mentioned, some of them are new drug plus old drug. Um, eight phase one trials that enroll all solid tumor types two are phase one or phase two, and five are straight phase two. So of those trials, 12 include novel targeted therapies. One is a, a targeted agent and an immunotherapy. One is chemo plus a HER2 targeted new drug. Three are just chemotherapy trials, and one is just a HER2 targeted drug. So it gives you a sense of the, the, the flavor of, of what we're currently doing, and that list changes every quarter or so because these trials tend to open and close pretty quickly. Um, our contact information is down there. I think there are a couple of things that have come to mind that we haven't mentioned that I think add to the frustration for patients and oncologists about clinical trials, and that is that a clinical trial might enroll a certain number of patients at a time. And, and so when we were looking at the clinical trials website out front um, with, with one of you, there's a status that says enrolling, on hold, not enrolling. Um, this can be frustrating. It's for safety reasons. We enroll three or four people and we see if they tolerate it before we go to the next dose. But it makes it really hard to know when could I enroll. And if I have to be off my current therapy for three weeks before I start the new drug, it's pretty important for me to know when's the next spot and is it mine. And, and that, I think, is something as a, as, a, as a doctor, an investigator, I try to be really transparent about what we know and if we don't know and we're just going to have to wait to see how the lady in Detroit does before we know if you have a spot to communicate that really carefully um, because obviously that adds to the anxiety of, of, the, of the whole process. Um, here's our website 
Um, and this screenshot actually is arranged alphabetically, which I think is the least helpful way, but you can see that um, you can see that over here on the left, you could sort by the drugs, by the doctor. We have a, a new module that's coming up that's just going to let you type in metastatic breast and then sort by stage of disease. So most cancer centers will have this kind of website. We were just on the UCLA website um, uh, looking at this with somebody else. So, um, so that's, that's a resource for you. I think before we take questions, um, a, a few other points I wanted to make. One is that um, only about 2 to 3 percent of cancer patients in this country enroll on clinical trials. And so I want to really acknowledge with gratitude the courageous contribution of all the people with metastatic breast cancer who've gone on clinical trials in the last decades because we really would not have any of the new treatments that we do without that contribution. It's amazingly, amazingly brave. Um, uh, and, um, you know, I think, Carrie, I'll speak for you that and many of my patients are sitting out there. You know, you all inspire us every day. Okay, so for a revised handout, please email Jean. <laughs> and we're going to, here, we're going to sort. Okay. It's like a card game here. Okay. Um, somebody made a comment, not a question. It's a very important comment. Study teams should include other stakeholders, patients, patient advocates, and caregivers. That's a great point. We probably don't do that well enough. We certainly do it in trials that are funded by particular grant funding mechanisms. There are patient advocates on all those um, advisory boards and um, involved in the development of the grants, but, but that may not be done as well. So I thank you for that comment. That's really great. This is a good one. Um, Oh, okay. Here's one. What does novel mean? I thought we defined everything and we didn't. Um, novel is a catch word. It just means new. I think it's um, a, a buzzword and uh, probably not well enough defined. But generally, when oncologists use it, they're talking about something that's not approved and that maybe has a mechanism of action that's different than the traditional cytotoxic chemotherapies. Um, Uh, is there a chance there could be a patient trial database created where we could input our info, cancer type, meds location, health status, et cetera, for trial consideration? Great. I don't think that the NCI is doing that. I do know that certain pharmaceutical sponsors are doing that, particularly since they're, somebody knows, surely knows. Jump in. Breastcancertrials.org. Okay. Thank you. Breastcancertrials.org. Okay. Um, why don't participating doctors in a multi-center trial get to see all the data? All right, I, I think that the premise of the question is not correct. We do. We don't get to see it every single day. We don't get to query the database, right? So if I have a trial collaboratively with Vanderbilt, I, if I'm the lead center, I can see Ingrid Meyer's data and our data, because it's loaded into our data set. She can only see the data on her patient, except at investigator meetings. For some of our trials, we have weekly meetings, sometimes biweekly, sometimes quarterly, and then summaries of the data are given. Um, you don't really want um, 400 sites and you know multiple investigators playing in the same database for data accuracy concerns. But I think there is a, a, a concerted effort to share the data with all of us because really I want to know what somebody's side effects at another center have been before I give this new pill to my patient. So, so we, we're, we're trying hard to, to answer that question. Um, if a phase one is working, can you stay on it after the study is over? Usually, yes, it depends a little bit on drug supply. So if the study is over because the drug is not working well and they're no longer producing it, then, then that may impact supply. When we ran the phase one trials with Tycurb, once it became clear that GW572016 was going to become Tycurb, then they closed those trials and um, developed what's called rollover trials, so expanded access for people who are still on drug and benefiting. And I think most pharmaceutical sponsors are, are making an effort to do that. Um, but that's a really good question to ask when you're talking to somebody like me about going on a trial. 
Um, what do you want? Oh, okay. what's going to do? Um, how is overall survival measured when people's experience post-trial is divergent? That's it, exactly right, and it's one of the reasons that we've had a lot of um, uh, heated debate about what's the best endpoint. Uh, you know that, for example, bevacizumab was approved and then not approved. Overall survival has been the um, uh, the gold standard, but obviously uh, if you're having a first-line therapy trial and everybody has six or seven different subsequent therapies, their change in survival may be due to those six and seven uh, therapies. So this is a really hot topic of debate. Is there an interim endpoint like time to progression or how many people progress in the first six months or um, progression-free survival? I Carrie, jump right in if you want to add to that. But. Um, Two more, golly. Um, uh, Off-label drug use, let's talk about that. When can a doctor mimic a trial that uses an approved drug for another indication that's now being tested for breast cancer for a patient who might benefit but um, does not meet eligibility? Um, what if insurance won't pay? So this is a great question. I don't have the answer to it. We actually have a study that's about to open where one of our colleagues is going to, to figure this out, I hope. Um, Junko Grilly Olson has a trial where if you have, um, I think she calls it um, right mutation, wrong tumor. So if you have a, a feature or biomarker in your cancer that means that you might be someone who would benefit from a drug that's only approved in lung cancer, can we get it for you? And how long does it take to get it? How much does it cost? Will insurance cover it? Is there foundation support? Is there a compassionate use program? And, and what percent of the time can, can we try to do this? It's in general very hard. Um, and then the last question um, that I'll answer is, um, somebody asked about what about liver disease? What if my liver is not functioning? How can I get medications? Um, and um, I would say that there are trials for people like you. They're called organ dysfunction trials. The NCI has a working group on organ dysfunction. So what the right dose of, of a drug for somebody whose kidneys or liver are not functioning might be different than the right dose that's that's approved or that's in testing for people with normal organ function. So you might think about that trial um, availability. I'm getting the hook. Yeah. <laughs>